system science is at the core of what we're trying to uh, suggest and, and invite people to think about as part of this uh, as part of this process. Um, the system science concept, as I mentioned, has been pursued from both communities that are represented at this meeting. And so the way we structured the session uh, was to try to invite uh, three, I, I want to say, um, you know, mid-career scientists who can offer three uh, different perspectives, three different takes on the system theme. And so I'm not going to say anything more about us, uh, you know, the systems or uh, definitions myself. I'm going to leave that to the speakers. And uh, so the first Speaker is going to be uh, Dave Heisel. All right, thanks very much, Josh. Uh, so I was asked to investigate uh, what it is uh, the heck that system science actually actually means. It's a term that's thrown around uh, widely, uh, and yet uh, I, I bet it, it doesn't mean what you may think it means. It doesn't mean what I may think it means. And so this is just really the beginning of a discussion, and I really encourage people to, uh, to pursue, pursue this on their, on their own. Uh, what I can tell you is that the history of system science is very rich, and if you begin reading, uh, it's not drudgery by any means. There are interesting twists and turns and a lot of very, uh, very uh, brilliant characters out there who have brought it to us. And uh, more importantly than that, there's real utility here. It's not just marketing. It really is something that will help us accomplish uh, the things that we, we want to do. So to get started here, I have uh, uh, some pictures of some sort, sort of stylized neurons on, uh, on my uh, backdrop here. And they're, and they're there for a reason. And they're there to motivate a couple of questions. And the first is this. You know, suppose you knew everything there was to know about one of these neurons, or all of these neurons. Would you understand animal behavior? A reductionist would say, Yes, probably. Why not? Where else would that information be if not here? The other question then is, if you wanted to study or understand animal behavior, would you have to know anything about how a neuron works? A systems person would say, probably not, no. You could replace the neurons with transistors, and perhaps behavior would remain the same. So, a few uh, starting points here. There really is no universal definition of what system science is. Nobody seems to be able to define it well without using the phrase system. And in the end, it may well be that system science is what, what you say it is. And uh, other communities have weighed in, and now it's our chance to see what it is that we say it is. But I will say that uh, the, uh, our perceptions about system science have been heavily colored by what your scientists have done. Um, 25 years ago, uh, the Earth scientists adopted systems as, as uh, their, their rubric, as their orbit organizing principle, and I think we're talking about this in large part because they adopted this 25 years ago, but their interpretation is, is different, I think, than, uh, than uh, system science either before what they've done or after. But it, I think it's helpful to, to understand where the, where the Earth scientists are first so that we can sort of uh, position our own frame of reference. So here's, here's an actual job ad. It's open right now. You can apply for it if you like. I've sort of redacted the, the names here. But uh, this is a job uh, opportunity for someone who wants to study Earth system science, which means, uh, in this context, emphasizing the interaction of atmospheric, oceanic, and land surface processes. How do all the, the bits of the Earth system interact together? So this is a job you can apply for right now, which is uh, sort of probably the best definition of what system science means to, to Earth scientists. And this doesn't come from the vacuum. Here's a, here's a definition of what Earth system science is all about. And what it means is uh, a synthesis and the development of a holistic model in which interdisciplinary processes and actions lead to interdisciplinary relevance. Holistic models, interdisciplinary relevance. Study everything, emphasize everything with lots of different people. There's a lot of, uh, uh, some of these, these slides are a little bit wordy, but I think words are important. Uh, here's some uh, pedagogical material that you can find. Um, Carlton College has uh, uh, an extensive web page trying to teach to, to students uh, what uh, system science is all about, or system science. And uh, it has phrases like, uh, any represent representation that divides the system, whatever that is, uh, is in danger of continuing a deconstructed perception. In reality, no part of the Earth system can be considered in isolation of any other part. That is a strong statement. You can't study anything 
without studying everything. And this, uh, this perception is, is completely emblematic in Earth system science, where the, the, the interpretation is all science must be global, all, must, all science must be interdisciplinary. You have to emphasize everything. And this culminated uh, in this, this famous uh, diagram, the Brotherton diagram. Brotherton convened uh, this panel, Earth System Science Committee uh, for NASA, and uh, they produced this diagram, which shows sort of every component you can imagine of, of uh, the Earth system as, as uh, Earth scientists would conceive it, including societal aspects. And um, evidently, this was crucial uh, in uh, the Earth people getting, um, getting missions, getting the mission to planet Earth, and which became EOS, which became a number of satellites. And so uh, this uh, greatly impressed uh, NASA and uh, opened up lots of funding opportunities for the Earth scientists and sort of propelled them along. Uh, in a manner that continues to this day. And, and it was famously commented that with this diagram, scientists had studied the solar system for many years. Now it was time to study the Earth system, which is perhaps where this word came from. That was the analogy. And the utility of this diagram was that it, it motivated, um, it, it moved some money. But, Oh, and I should say that uh, this diagram, if you notice, has lots of boxes and arrows, and that's typical of this Brotherton diagram and other Brotherton diagrams. And so it sort of suggests systems. Systems engineering and system science often is identified by lots of circles and lines and arrows. But in fact, I, I really think the, the, the takeaway message here for, for the Earth uh, sciences people was that study everything. Uh, leave nothing out. Uh, be aware of every possible piece of connection, work globally, work interdisciplinary, and that has become sort of the proxy meaning in, in, uh, in this discipline and others for what system science is. And that's fine. And certainly there's a lot of uh, global work going on in, in CEDAR and global work going on in JAM, and interdisciplinary work is, is uh, uh, generally to be lauded and encouraged. But this really isn't what systems started out as. And uh, here are some people who would, who would argue with that perspective. These are, these are really some of the, the big names in, in systems. And uh, their work goes back uh, to a time before the Second World War. In fact, uh, the, the principles of systems were articulated between the world wars. And uh, this name is probably the, the first person who published widely on it, uh, Bertil Anthe. Um, this document down here, an outline for general systems theory, is available on the web. It's a short read, and it's a very, very good read, and it explains really what it was that set this, uh, this movement in motion. There's an international society of system science that meets and publishes, and, uh, and there are a lot of heavy hitters on this list. On the left, there are, uh, there are sort of a natural scientist, Margaret Mead, among them, and on the right, there are um, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, um, people in, uh, sort of more involved in IT sort of things, uh, Lyapina, Poincaré, Gelman, Neumann. And uh, you, you can imagine that their life's work was a little bit more than uh, admonition to study everything. And uh, in particular, uh, Burton Affley was a, was a biologist. In fact, many of the people up here were, bi were biologists. And, and his view was this, you know, he really admired the physicists. The physicists had first principles models. They could write them down, connect them together, and write laws that not only predicted what was happening in, in whatever context they had written those laws, but would predict what was happening in other contexts too. They could write universal laws. And that really impressed a biologist who didn't have any first principles laws. And nonetheless, though, could see uh, recurring behaviors that, that span many, many different um, um, contexts in biology. And what he really wanted was to see if there was some way to develop universal laws in fields like biology that, that seemingly were there because different biological contexts work the same way, but without having the first principles to start with? Is there some way to bootstrap? Is there some way to proceed even where you lack first principles at the very most granular, granular level? So he's very impressed by the fact that the, the law that governs uh, compound interest is the same law that governs population growth. Clearly, you don't have to know how a bank works to understand or to make use of that, that law. And so possibly you don't need first principles all the time in order to write down laws that are going to be useful to you. And the more complicated, complicated and sprawling the thing it is that you want to study, the more important that concept uh, would be. So what I'm showing you here, and I don't expect you to read this, but this is, this is the Brotherton Diagram of System Science. In fact, you can find a Brotherton Diagram of anything. If you look on the web, you can find the Brotherton Diagram of Brotherton Diagrams. But what it shows you is that uh, this is a huge field, and it's been around for a long time, starting in the 40s and going up in today. 
And you know, each one of these circles is perhaps a meeting like this one here. So this isn't to be taken lightly, this is deep. Systems theory has three major trunks. Um, system dynamics is one of them, complexity is one, and cybernetics is another. And any one of these is something you might receive a degree in or go to attend a meeting in. And uh, it's very hard to read, but there are, there are things here that, that we, uh, we know something about. Uh, fractals and chaos reside up here someplace. These are tools that we know about. Um, someplace in here, there's uh, self-organization. Uh, down here, there's cellular automata and um, genetic algorithms and you know, all kinds of tools that we know about. But they all fit into this sort of larger picture. And uh, so what I want to do is just talk about how these, these three different areas are, are the same and how potentially they, they play into the kind of uh, things that we worry about. By the way, there's a Wikipedia page for systems theory. There's also a Facebook page for systems theory. And if you want a definition of a system, uh, elements in standing relationship is probably as good a uh, definition as you'll find. And this is really the point. With systems theory, the emphasis shifts from the parts to the organization. It does not grow to encompass everything. Systems does not say emphasize everything. It shifts. The emphasis shifts from the parts, which a reductionist might dwell on, to the organization in the hopes of, by seeding some of the, the granular details of the problem and, and rising to a higher level of abstraction, perhaps finding a, a greater, broader, more universal uh, truth. The contradiction with reductionism in conventional theory, which focuses on the parts, is a, is a changing assumption, and that's all it is to it. So you may work, concentrate on the parts if you think that's where the value is. You can concentrate on the organization if you think that's where the value is. So this is uh, the 1950 references I pointed you to, and I, I really encourage you to read it. It's quite readable, it's quite digestible, it's a good read. And. Uh, And this is the main idea. We're looking for general systems laws which apply to, to a system of a certain type which has a certain organization to it, not necessarily certain parts, but a certain organization. And, uh, and that those properties are going to be a constant regardless of the elements that are involved. Systems theory is a logical mathematical discipline. It's purely formal, and it's applicable to all sciences concerned with systems. And the best analogy you'll find uh, to systems theory is probability theory, probability and statistics. It's a formalism, it's abstract, you can apply it to anything you like, and the main goal is to take something that is intractable and make it tractable. And uh, with, with, uh, with um, probability and statistics, you do that by taking things that you can't enumerate and you convert them to things that you can deal with, averages and moments and so forth. And with systems, you try to do something rather similar. And at some level, the task is to state laws that are appropriate for the different strata of reality. If you can't solve the problem using ballistic particles, Avogadro's number of ballistic particles, use a kinetic theory. If you can't use kinetic theory, use a two-fluid theory. If you can't use a two-fluid theory, use an MHD theory, so forth and so on. We do this now. But seed uh, details at the lowest strata so that you can uh, start to look for organizational patterns at a higher level of abstraction. So one of the areas where this occurs is uh, systems dy dynamics. I went and I grabbed a 300-level a a textbook in systems dynamics that we used at Cornell, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it. And I had a lot of trouble finding the difference between systems dynamics and dynamics. It looked like a dynamics textbook to me. And really, the difference is that in dynamics, you deal with differential equations, and in systems dynamics, you deal with systems of differential equations. And I think that's a more powerful metaphor than the solar system. And the system itself is, is a mapping between the state and the things that drive the state, and that's it. The system can be dynamic if the mapping depends on past inputs. If superposition doesn't hold, it's nonlinear. If orders change drastically under small perturbations, it's unstable. And if, all, if it's all of those things, it's complex. And that's the appropriate way to use those words. And in order to come up with a mapping that actually functions, some kind of balance has to be struck between accuracies and simplicity, and that's really the idea. And the goal is to find a system that reproduces the observed properties. So um, 
One often sees in systems theory boxes with lines connecting them, and, uh, and this is really what it's all about. You have some kind of a, a state of a system, which we represent by y, which could be a state vector if it's a linear algebra, it could be something else. It's driven by something called x. The mapping is h, and that is the system, and there can be some noise involved. And of course, this is extensible. You can start connecting these things together to form more systems, and then more, and then more. But fundamentally, this is what the system is. Here's a mapping, here's its driver, here's its state. If you don't know what the driver is and you know everything else, you're solving the, in, the inverse problem. If you don't know what h is, you're identifying the system. If you don't know what either of these things is, you're doing factor analysis, and sometimes that's true, and it turns out you can actually persevere. And the way that you try to figure out how to proceed what your, with what your system actually is, well, there are lots of ways. You can, you can you know, correlate the output with the input and sort of regard the system as a filter. You can try to construct a, a system that, in a, in a least square sense, gives the minimum error between the observed and the predicted state. You can decompose the system uh, into optimal basis functions through something like singular value decomposition. And uh, you can insist, for instance, if y is h of x, you can insist that h is y of x, which mean, gives rise to these rules, and then you can do whatever you have to to make these things work, to make this the identity and that the identity. Or you can use Bayesian statistics and say, well, the probability of a system given some state is the probability of the state given some system, which maybe you know, times the probability of a state, which maybe you know a priori, and you can apply this iteratively and, ha and come up with some kind of a Bayesian method. In any case, you develop something like a pseudo-inverse that you can apply to a known state to, know, to figure out then what the system is that produced it. And there's this inter interesting uh, idea of, of model order selection. How do you know the order of the, uh, the system to begin with? You may not uh, know that. You may have to choose that. Uh, there are lots of different rules for this stuff, lots of different methodologies. One thing you can do is uh, upon this decomposition, you can decide that you know, some, uh, some singular values are so small you can just throw them out. This seems very abstract, but we've been talking, for instance, about the problem. If you want to fly a constellation of satellites to, to measure something, how do you know how many satellites you need? That's really uh, a model order selection problem, and we could solve that problem and, and know uh, by, by writing down what it is that we let, can measure, what it is that's driving it, and in between is our satellites and how many we need. And then you count how many sig significant singular values there are, and maybe you know how many satellites you need. Here's uh, some work from a friend of mine who studies, uh, studies heart. He studies cardiac rhythms. And so he's developed a system. And the thing is, this is not some kind of finite element picture of a heart. It's more abstract than that. What he's done is he's got boxes and arrows connecting um, uh, sodium potassium pumps. And he's written down some kind of a differential equation for how these interactions occur. And he didn't get them from first principles. He studied cardiac rhythms and wrote down equations that he thought would apply. He hooked them all together. And he found basically these uh, 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 you know, eigen responses. This is the, the, free, uh, the forced response. Uh, here's a, a, a free response. Here's another mode, another free response. Add them together, you get this. And supposedly, my friend tells me this looks just like a, a tachycardia. And in fact, this works much better than his competitors who are actually building little finite element models of hearts that look like little hearts. This is more abstract. You can't cut open a heart and find this picture. Uh, nevertheless, by sticking sort of the appropriate relationships in here and tuning them, uh, one can recover the behavior that one wants. And then you can go back and interrogate the equations that you wrote down and see why they are the equations that you wrote down. Another area of systems is cybernetics. Now everybody thinks robots, robotics. Cybernetics is not robotics. Cybernetics is control systems. And the reason that those apply is the following. If you think about you know, the magnetosphere being bombarded by uh, variations in the solar wind, Nonetheless, the magnetosphere is still there later on, and it persists, and it persists, and persists, despite drastic changes to the environment that it's in. In that sense, it's, it's a control system. Somehow, it self-regulates in such a way that it persists. And you can regard it as a control system. Um, much of the work in control systems was done by Raj Ashby, who actually started out as a life scientist, and then realizes that he had to think about uh, these kinds of things in order to understand uh, how, how, how living things um, regulate themselves. And uh, there's somebody called Pat Stafford Beer who came up with this, this, uh, this little acronym here. And what this means is the purpose of a system is what it does. And uh, one need not look any deeper than that. When your system is doing what it's supposed to, you understand it. And so uh, ideas involving black boxes connected by Markov chains uh, uh, predominate here. There's a concept of variety, how many, how, far, uh, how many different kinds of states uh, can be expressed. 
If all states can be expressed and the system isn't well regulated, amongst the states are states where the system doesn't exist anymore. So if a system is regulated, that means that you have to limit variety, the number of states it can express, and so regulation becomes an important concept. How do you limit variety? And it turns out if you limit variety in some parts of the system, uh, you limit it even more in other parts of the system, and that gives rise to a notion of amplification. And there's, there's a mathematical formalism that connects all these things together, and you can use it. So you can imagine, imagine taking uh, a, a system in, in geospace, which you have to define. You can't say the system. You have to define your system. But having done so, you can imagine using the formalism to, to understand it in terms of uh, regulation and control theory. And uh, this becomes uh, very efficacious when the systems get large and complex. And finally, uh, just a few words about complexity. Um, we know, know about ideas of, like, of self-similarity and preferential attachment and uh, the idea of things like uh, Kolmogorov spectrum and craig Cra spectrum and so forth. In fact, um, complexity theory began when people started to realize, hey, you know, I can, I can look at a mechanical system and I can use Newton's laws to understand what it's doing and write down all the forces and write down very complicated things. And I could imagine studying a ladder, you know, sort of sliding down a wall here, and I'd have to write down all the forces, including the reaction forces of the ladder sitting against the wall. But I don't actually know that force until I solve for the dynamics, but I need that force to solve for the dynamics, so it's very complicated, and what do I do? Well, if you, if you use a variational approach, uh, you know, Lagrangian or Hamiltonian mechanics, you never write down forces. They never appear. You write down a constraint that the ladder has to sit against the wall until it can't anymore. You solve the problem having never written down any forces. You bypass that whole layer of detail. And if you're interested in the forces, you can back them out later. But in fact, you know, using variational mechanics instead of Newtonian mechanics is the first example of, uh, of how you can uh, use complexity theory, how you can bypass levels of detail that you don't necessarily care about and still come up with completely formally accurate solutions to problems. There are ideas of stochastic calculus and mean flow electrodynamics where you regard certain details in the environment that you're studying as essentially noise regardless of how it got there. And you redefine your differential equations uh, just allowing for the fact that there's noise, again, without worrying about how it got there or what it's doing. Sort of relegate details that you don't understand to, to noise-like things and then just worry about their statistics. And a multi-scale theory fits into this uh, topic as well. So I just want to conclude by, by thinking about some examples to try and ground this a little bit. And these are examples that are not global, and these are examples that don't involve boxes and arrows, although they, they could if we wanted them to. And I, I thought I could show some examples that really uh, are emblematic in CEDAR of systems. But then I thought, maybe I'll just pick some examples out of things that I'm doing. Uh, that's, that's kind of the goal, I suppose, that we might all do that. And so the first thing that I'm showing you here is some numerical simulations of, of equatorial spread F. And these are, up here I'm showing current densities in the equatorial plane around some, some rising depletions. And here are some current densities in the zonal, in the meridional plane. The way people predict spread F right now is they write down some system of equations, you know, conservation of number density, momentum, and so forth. And then they set up a big complicated initial value problem. They turn it on. They let it run. They see if spread F developed or not, or, uh, developed or it didn't. And then you try some different initial conditions and try it again and try it again. That's not how people predict hurricanes. People predict hurricanes by, by measuring the sea surface temperature, and it's above 80 degrees, you get hurricanes. And so in some sense, maybe the details here aren't important. You know, there's some free energy in this, bound up in the initial conditions here, and maybe we should just count the free energy. We don't really care whether there's a wiggle here or a depletion over there. We just want to know if they're spread out. So a systems approach to this problem would, in fact, be to go to a higher level of abstraction, count the free energy, set some kind of criteria, and see if, if that's how you can predict things. I'm not aware of anyone ever attempting that. It might work. Here's another problem that I've been working on. I've been working on uh, uh, saturation of, of uh, farley boomin waves. And the idea is when these things propagate, they propagate. They produce lots of secondary waves and tertiary waves and nonlinear waves all over the place. And there are numerical codes that try and keep track of all that to figure out how the farley boomin waves saturate. But maybe the thing to do is just relegate all that, that crud just regard it as, as noise, regard it as stochastic fluctuations in the background. Write down the differential equations, allowing for the fact that there are stochastic fluctuations in the background, say in the index of refraction, and then generate a differential equation for the mean flow where all, this, where all this, uh, the statistical properties of that crud of the index of refraction fluctuations, which we'll regard as, as random variables, are sort of contained in some, a few moments. And then solve this equation rather than this, this equation. 
And it turns out you can do that. And it turns out this is a very general formula for how the, the means of variables evolve when they're impacted by or when, when they contain statistical components, uh, stochastic components. So don't solve this again and again and again for a whole bunch of different uh, initial conditions with different you know, initial noise in them like, uh, like you would do if you were doing some kind of a, um, uh, uh, an ensemble Kalman filter approach or something like that. Instead, rewrite your equations for the mean, allowing for the fact that there's fluctuations out there that are characterized by their statistics. This actually works, and there's a really nice paper, summary paper that describes how to do this kind of thing. And then the last example, um, sort of bypassing the formalism, I'm interested in how um, upper hybrid waves and electron Bernstein waves couple in, in ionospheric modification experiments. And if you work really, really hard, you can develop a dispersion relation that shows how these are coupled. And this comes from kinetic theory and you know, the, taking the longitudinal projection of the, of the dielectric tensor and, and doing things to it and manipulating. And with great effort, you can come up with this coupled differential equation, which tells you that these modes are coupled, but doesn't tell you how. What you'd really like to have is, is the wave equations for upper hybrid and electron burn seed modes coupled together, but it's very difficult to write those. It's very difficult to write those from first principles. But I know this. I'm going to guess some differential equations, coupled differential equations for these two modes, upper hybrid and electron Bernstein modes. I'm going to guess them such that they reproduce this. They're not coming from first principles, but they're doing what they have to do. A uh, the purpose of a system is what it does. I will guess some simple coupled differential equations that reproduce this, and I'll solve those. And that's easy and attractable, and you can solve these on a computer. You can very simply can solve them analytically. And it's system science in the sense that I'm sort of bypassing or stepping past some low level of granularity, not demanding that I have uh, first principles of equations, because I might not have them, or they may be too complicated, there may be too many of them. And instead, I'm sort of moving up a level of an abstraction to try and recover the behavior by, by, by essentially proposing elements for my systems, my mappings, that do the right thing. So in summary, a system scientist probably would not approach animal behavior by focusing on neurons. Nor would a system science scientist demand to study every neuron. Instead, the system scientist would emphasize the organization of the neurons, seeking, uh, at an abstract level, seeking some kind of universal behavior. Remember that the system doesn't exist until you define it. If we achieve nothing else, it's just wrong for people to say, it's so important that we study the whole system, or the whole system is so complex, or the whole system is really big. There isn't a system until you tell us what it is. And if your system is charge exchange between H plus and O plus, that's your system. On the other hand, if you'd like to study sprawling, enormous, uh, uh, complicated, interdisciplinary global problems, this is probably an effective way to do it. And of course, we're doing these things already. But there's utility, I think, in recognizing that so that we can communicate about it in a different way. And we can communicate this to other people uh, who already use this kind of language. And uh, we can communicate this when we, we, when we propose to new um, you know, NSF initiatives that are, are geared towards um, you know, IT people and other kinds of people that, uh, that are comfortable with this language. So that's, that's what I've learned. So thank you very much.